Can love persist as dementia gradually erodes memory and physical abilities? The answer may be in the immense power of human relationships. This is Reach MD, and I'm your host, Dr. Maurice Pickard. And today our guest is Dr. Edward Shaw, an oncologist and mental health counselor and the founder of Memory Counseling Program at Wake Forest Baptist Health in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. He and Dr. Gary Chapman and Deborah Barr have recently written a book that today we're going to discuss and I think we'll all find meaningful. It's called Keeping Love Alive as Memories Fade, The Five Languages and the Alzheimer Journey. Thank you very much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. You're very welcome. I'm glad to be with you. Can you tell me, how did you come to write this book? What was the process? Because I've just said you're an oncologist, and I believe you specialize in brain pathology. So how did you come to the, make this particular journey of your own? Well, it's really a story of something that occurred within our family, and that is that in 2007, my wife, Rebecca, was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's disease. At the time, I was a practicing radiation oncologist and focused in adults and children who had brain tumors and treatment of those disorders. And my area of research interest for almost three decades now has been cognitive function in cancer patients. So I recognized early on in my wife that she was beginning to have issues with her memory, learning new information, multitasking, and it was that early recognition that led us to a pathway of her being diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's. And how did you make this shift into the subject matter of the five languages of love that you apparently are using in your counseling service now? Well, when Rebecca was diagnosed, we have three adult daughters who at the time were 18, 20, and 22. And you know, we were all pretty devastated by the diagnosis of this progressive neurodegenerative disease that we we're told would take her life in eight to 10 years and she'd be progressively needing more care, maybe nursing home care eventually. And we had nowhere to turn emotionally. We had great medical care, but really nowhere to turn emotionally. And that prompted a career change for me. So I actually stepped away from being a practicing oncologist. I got a graduate degree in mental health counseling and started a counseling center at my employer, Wake Forest Baptist Health in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, a counseling center for families on the same journey that we were on. And what I had recognized early on in counseling other families was that while the person with dementia would experience a progressive loss of memory skills, language skills, their ability to express themselves emotionally, they were still very capable of receiving emotional love. It's just that what typically would happen is that their primary care partner, perhaps spouse or an adult child, would sort of step back as they saw their loved one having progressive cognitive loss. And the five love languages was something my wife and I had actually been to a seminar of Dr. Gary Chapman's 15 or 20 years ago when the original book had come out. And I, I had the framework of the five love languages in mind. And it's a simple framework, yet it's very powerful. And I found it very applicable working with families on the dementia journey. For those of us who have not read Dr. Chapman's book, or yours yet, could you tell me what are the five languages of love? The five love languages are a way that a person can communicate emotional love to another person. And Dr. Chapman, in years of practice as a marriage counselor and a pastor, observed that there were five ways that people tended to communicate their love to one another. The first love language is words of affirmation. So these are unsolicited words of affection or appreciation given from one person to another. The second love language is quality time, where you make the commitment to give another person your full and undivided attention. The third love language is gifts, a visible symbol of love. It might be a purchased item or a handmade item. It can even be something that you find, but it's a tangible gift that would have meaning to the person you're giving it to. The fourth love language is acts of service, doing things to help another person with the specific goal of to help lighten their load. And the last love language is physical touch. It's deliberately touching somebody to convey your presence to them. 
And so what he observed is that people tend to communicate their love to others in one primary love language, and then they may have sort of other love languages that they communicate love with as well. But for most of us, we have one primary love language. And the importance of the framework is that, let's say, you and your wife are reading the book, and what you want to do is to understand what your partner's primary love language is and communicate in that way to them. So if their primary love language is gifts, something like flowers or maybe a box of chocolates is going to speak much more than a hug, perhaps. What Dr. Chapman has observed since the book came out 25 years ago, now published in some 55 languages, there's this transcultural approach with the five love languages that really helps people of all ethnicities, races, cultures uh, to communicate emotional love to one another through this framework. It doesn't have to be the same language. It's important to maybe to recognize what your partner's is, but it may not be the same as yours. You know, our audience is mainly healthcare professionals. How do they use these particular lessons, which I think are very profound, both professionally and maybe even personally in their own lives, but particularly professionally? Personally, the five love language framework makes one reflect on their own close relationships. After all, the communication of love is probably more important in any relationship than anything else. And so makes you reflect about how you are communicating love to your spouse or your partner and to make you conscious that what's important is speaking their love language when you're wanting to love them. What we often do is communicate love to others through the language we tend to want love communicated to us. I think in the professional setting, we're in this tsunami of people who are aging up you know, into their 70s and 80s and 90s with the baby boomers and the incidence of Alzheimer's disease and other dementias is going to be increasing. And so physicians and healthcare providers are going to be seeing more patients who have dementia, but also we use the term primary care partner rather than caregiver, but their care partner and maybe the others involved in caregiving. And one of the real central themes of the book is that the person who has Alzheimer's disease, they maintain the ability to receive love all the way through the journey. It can typically be right to the end of their journey with Alzheimer's disease. What really fades as their cognitive function fades is their ability to express love. And so I think physicians who are mindful of this or healthcare providers you know, can really say to their patient and their provider, you're going to see these cognitive changes, but it doesn't mean that your loved one with dementia can't benefit from receiving love. Just you as care partner, caregiver, are going to have to work harder to express that love. Our book presents the five love languages as a toolkit for expressing emotional love to somebody who has Alzheimer's disease. It's fundamentally the same five love language framework. So I think that's one very important thing from the book. The other important thing is that because the care partner takes on a greater burden for keeping the emotional aspect of the relationship going, there's much more burden on the primary care partner. It's a hard job just caring for the person's physical needs, but also to be mindful that that person has emotional needs, both the patient but also the the caregiver. Alzheimer's caregiving is a team sport. It's not something one does on their own, and you have to be very mindful of recruiting a team because it's very easy to burn out as a caregiver. So so I think those are the two messages, that the the patient remains emotionally uh, capable of receiving love, even though it may not be so apparent from the way they present themselves uh, cognitively and that the primary care partner really need a lot of support. When I was practicing internal medicine, I frequently became more worried, if one can use that word, or certainly concerned about the caregiver or care partner, seeing them under the the tremendous stresses that they experienced. And do you think that by keeping a love relationship going, that this will indeed have benefit for the care partner's own personal health? Oh, I think absolutely, Maury. The ability to maintain relationship with somebody who's losing cognitive function, you know, who presumably is, you know, a life partner. It's not only great for that person, and I truly believe it may not just improve the quality of their life, but maybe the length of their life. 
but it's also important for the care partner, the caregiver, because this is a person who they've been often a life partner with, and to be able to maintain some level of emotional intimacy, you know, even in the face of this terrible disease, provides some encouragement on an otherwise very hard path. Recently on C-SPAN, I watched Dr. Roy Peterson, professor of Alzheimer's research at Mayo Clinic, and actually Rebecca's doctor, and I believe made the diagnosis in Rebecca's case, and Lisa Barron, a founder of a not-for-profit organization called Memory Care Home Solution, appearing before the U.S. Senate on the Special Committee on Aging, discussing this very issue. Do you think we're doing enough for care partners now? Do they have our attention? There's no question that if something happens to the care partner, the whole system falls apart. Yes, absolutely. Well, I think in medicine today, and it sounds as though you've retired, I, I think things have really changed. There's a lot more burden on the physician now for adequate documentation, more involvement to provide what's necessary to properly submit a bill on a patient and be paid. That These aspects of a doctor's practice have taken much more time than they ever have, at least in the 30 years I've practiced medicine and wind up taking time away from both the care of the patient and I think the care of the caregiver. And I think there's no family of diseases where the health of the caregiver is more important than in neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's disease. I think there's some other terrible neurodegenerative diseases where it's a similar challenge like Parkinson's disease or or maybe uh, Lou Gehrig's disease. But I think whether it's the physician themselves or a member of their team that, you know, it's obviously important to check in on the, the medical health and the mental health of the patient, the person with the dementia, but equally important for the caregiver. Because as you just mentioned, and really most families don't think about this, what happens if something happens to the primary care partner? They develop pneumonia or they have a fall and all of a sudden they're out of the picture the apple cart can get upset very quickly. If you're just tuning in, you're listening to Reach MD. I'm your host, Dr. Maurice Pickard, and we're discussing a new book, Keeping Love Alive as Memory Fades, with the author, Dr. Edward G. Shaw. There was an interesting quote that I read recently, and it was almost paraphrasing something you said in your book. The quote was, remember that life is not made of years, but of moments, that every moment will guide your conduct, Eli Wiesel. And you in your book said, moments sustain us and can be meaningful. A moment with a patient can be meaningful. What did you mean? There are several meanings to what we wrote in the book. One of the really great challenges of working in the field of dementia care is that the main issue, the most common neurocognitive disorder is Alzheimer's disease, and the main feature of that disease is progressive loss of memory. And so as a person's memory fades, they begin to lose their connection with past. They really stop thinking about the future. And when you're the care partner or even you're the physician care provider, when you're with that patient, you are really only in the moment with that patient. They really don't have a concept of past and future in the way that we do. And so moments become much more important in the relationship because the relationship is in some ways, it's a series of moments rather than a chunk of integrated time where you have past, present, and future. And you just think about it in a, a conversation when you go home from work and you're talking to your spouse or colleague, a friend, whoever, you're always referring to the past, the present, and the future. And so in the book, we just make it apparent that there is this challenge of always being in the present moment with the person who has Alzheimer's disease or a dementia where memory is a primary issue. And therefore, you have to make the most of each moment. The expression of love to somebody in the moment who has the disease, even very late in the disease, can generate from them a smile. They could turn and you know give you a kiss on the cheek. Those little moments for caregivers who you know face the burden of caregiving on a day-to-day -day basis can really carry the day, they can carry the week, they can even carry the month. And moments become much more meaningful than they ever have in the past. In your book, just to paraphrase what you just say, the ability to receive love endures far longer than the ability to express it. It's something we don't think about. 
Well, we don't. And I think this is probably the most important message of the entire book is exactly what you just said, that that person is capable of receiving love, usually right to the end of their disease. There was a quote that you also use that I will always remember. I, I had not heard it before. People will forget what you said. People will forget what you did. But people will never forget how you made them feel. It's a, a quote that I think your book really substantiates, this, this ability to use love language to make people feel a certain way, even though you may not know they're feeling it. Yes, and that's a quote from Maya Angelou, who is a famous poet who, who passed away fairly recently. But she was here at Wake Forest University, and it's just a wonderful quote of hers that we felt was important to emphasize some of the principles of our book. The book is so beautiful and has so many ideas. One of them is the concept of chesed, H-E-S-E-D. Not everyone can say chesed. Some people will say chesed, but it's chesed. And you use it in such a beautiful way. I wonder if you would just comment on it. Well, chesed is a Hebrew word that very simply is translated as giving love. It's almost a meaning that is more of a verb than a noun. And the term chesed refers to intentional love or sacrificial love. It's love that gives but doesn't really ask for anything in return. I think the hardest thing I do, I meet with newly diagnosed persons with dementia and their spouse or their adult children. Every week I see new families affected by this disease. And what I always will say to the care partner and whoever the extended caregivers are, the hardest thing I have to tell you is that you're going to carry the emotional burden, the emotional relationship, as your loved one progressively loses that ability. This is a hard journey. This is where the notion of, of chesed comes in, is that you're really motivated out of a sense of love and duty and responsibility to someone who's perhaps been your life partner to give them a servant's love. Sometimes I feel like equipping the person with that information, even though it's a, it's kind of adds weight to their metaphorical backpack, if you will, it really helps them to know what's ahead and how they can recruit others to help them to give this intentional love, this chesed. After finishing your book, I began to realize that this book helps us on this journey that no one wants to take. And along the way, there is so much to learn about living more and living better. And as Dylan Thomas has said, to be able to go gently into the good night. Thank you, Dr. Shaw, for joining us. Thank you, Maury. Appreciate it so much. For those of you who may have missed this discussion, please visit ReachMD.com and download this podcast and many others in this series. Again, thank you for listening.